Good morning, and you will see that in my presentation I have slightly changed the title of my research over the past two years. When I started to work on this presentation, I tried to remember um, the, the very day I, I, I received this award, and um, it feels like it was yesterday. Um, however, I made a lot of progress on my PhD since. I've been doing a lot of field work over the past two years, and I'm going to start the, to work on the bulk of the material to actually draw conclusions this summer. So, uh, this morning I would like to look back at what I have done over the past two years, and I would like to thank, of course, the Foundation for this award and for the support and uh, the comfort they have uh, given me over the past two years. So for those of you who were here two years ago, you may remember that I, I thought it was important to look at uh, food consumption in elementary schools, the construction of uh, interaction between kids and what the, the role of food is um, at school. Uh, the project has somewhat changed, as I said, over the past two years, but the main objective remains unchanged. I was able to find that a lot of research has been conducted on socialization, socialization of children and socialization of food, which are the main two areas of investigation in my study. Uh, Régine Surota, for example, has done uh, research on birthday, uh, birthday parties as well as uh, school or during recess at school. However, some areas of socialization at school have been very little uh, investigated by sociologists and this is why I decided to work on this in my research and hopefully, hopefully to provide and allow some new information to emerge about eating at school. Uh, at school being the cafeteria and then the snack which is oftentimes uh, consumed after school finishes or during recess. So, as I said, my project, my project has slightly changed. I would like you to give you a little bit of background information. The initial purpose was to look at uh, <clears throat> the impact of food models um, uh, as shown in the media, the family, and at school. So the initial assumption was to say that parents influence how contradictory messages are dealt with in different ways according to income or according to the socio-economic level. And as I said, when you do sociology or human sciences or in any other discipline, I had to make some arbitrary decisions and I, I, I decided to narrow uh, the scope of the study a little bit. So uh, the new um, problematic uh, as, as it stands today is to specifically look at uh, child socialization <coughs> and food in schools. And this time the, the assumption is that uh, learning and assimilating uh, food-related values differs according to households and to their socioeconomic situation. So, uh, again, in both cases, we're looking very much at the ethnic background and income. Um, I also wanted to work on the impact of media, uh, but clearly this was uh, this represented too much work. So this is why I somewhat narrowed the scope of the study and decided to leave out the impact of media. So I'd like to uh, come back for a few minutes to the methodology. I uh, looked uh, at the existing bibliography in three areas: sociology of food, sociology of childhood, and sociology of education. Since uh, my study is mainly geared towards schools. Then uh, I did a, a, a comparative study uh, that lasted two years, which is going to be completed um, in a few weeks. We took three elementary schools. Uh, we looked. Uh, we carefully picked the schools based on their uh, location. We uh, to have uh, uh, the, in terms of represent representativity, uh, different um, income levels uh, represented. Um, as far as the tools are concerned, most of the study is qualitative. So at the end of the two years, I should have roughly 200 hours of observation in the cafeteria. Um, concretely what I did is I, I spent a lot of time in the cafeteria eating with children. I also have a log. So every day or on average two or three days every week, 
I would write down um, in a very specific way, accurate way, what kids would eat, what kind of snacks, for example, how much did they share their food and how much did they share, uh, was, uh, is there a correlation between gender and sharing and so on. And, uh, I, that, and then backed this up with uh, what I call semi-directive interviews. I did 30 such interviews with uh, staff working in the cafeteria as well as families. So much for the qualitative uh, study. Um, then there is the quantitative information. I initially I wanted to do a questionnaire with families, but uh, I realized it would be better to conduct interviews rather than having um, those questionnaires. Of course, there's there the cost of performing um, a questionnaire, uh, which was important. Um, so I decided to uh, organize um, interviews um, to have more information about snacks. Once again, um, some statistical information as well based on my observations. Um, I specifically looked at the genders, how do the girls uh, behave versus the boys um, during uh, lunch at school and so on. So this uh, breaks down the figures. This gives you the, the key figures. Uh, so the three schools, we have three schools, school one, two and three. Um, school one is upper class on average, school two is middle class and school three is um, well, it's mid middle class. School two is lower, lower class. We have the number of uh, classes, the total head counts, the number of children eating at the cafeteria, and we have the total numbers at the bottom. What I'd like to do now is to share some of the results. Uh, they are not final results. Once again, I'm still uh, completing and finishing uh, my field work at this point, so I do not have the final results, uh, but I have a fairly good idea of uh, what they will look like. <clears throat> so we simply have to be cautious with some of this, uh, some of this data. So what I've seen in my um, observations and uh, during my field work is the importance of games, playing with children. Nothing new there, but it, it is more important than what I had expected. No matter what the children do, no matter uh, what income, no matter where, children like to play. And this may seem, once again, very obvious. Uh, but it is extremely important, and I'm, I'm listing some of uh, uh, s some interesting observations here. Uh, for example, at school in, in the cafeteria, kids like to play with food and like to transform it. For example, here is an example with an omelette. An omelette, um, um, and in this case, the zucchini, which the zucchini was not very successful, except for playing. You may know the game of the apple as well, where you twist the stem and you count and uh, after once it breaks off you, you have a number and that's the number uh, that's your age um, there are different types of uh, of games children like to play with food so they actually turn uh, food into into games then there is um, some of the uh, some of my observations were on the objects used around food. For example, knives, <clears throat> glasses, plates. You all know, uh, or, or, your, or your children have probably looked at their age at the bottom, in the bottom of, uh, of their glass. And this is something, I think it is universal. This never changes. Uh, children like to play with their knife. It's a little bit like the bottle where you turn the bottle. So instead of turning the bottle, they turn the knife. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, it can be quite dangerous. And when the, the, the knife stops turning, it points to someone. So no kissing, don't worry. But uh, for example, you're the, you're the dumbest or you're the smartest. Um, so like, they like to play with that. They like to play 
um, with water as well. <coughs> I can I could give you a lot of examples. Then they like to play contests and they like to talk to each other. Once again, and I have to be cautious here, but uh, generally speaking, the boys uh, get, invo get involved more. For example, contests. Who has uh, the most Playmobiles? And, um, and at the end, we have a winner. Sometimes we don't have a winner. Sometimes it never ends. Or who, whoever knows a story better than the others? Who knows Santa Claus? Um, and uh, ultimately, the purpose of those games or contests is to have a winner. Last but not least, and this is probably the most obvious one, children who take toys to school. <clears throat> Teddy bears, for example. Here are some pictures. Bracelets. Um, uh, bracelets or playing cards. Uh, but it depends a lot on how much freedom is given to children in a given school. Some schools do not allow any toys on their premises. Uh, but kids are smart. They sometimes hide them in their bags or in their pockets and they end up uh, showing them to their peers over lunch. Those games occur more frequently in uh, cafeterias where the children are served and in cafeterias, in self-service cafeteria, simply because of time, because of the fact there is less time to play, children play less. Um, in cafeterias where children are served, sometimes lunch can last 45 and up to an hour. Uh, and it, it is, you can't just expect children to sit down and do nothing, uh, except for eating. <clears throat> for snacks, um, Snacks are generally uh, put in boxes, lunch boxes, small bags. Um, there was one school where kids have a lunch box. Uh, one started and then all the others did the same thing. Little bags like the one that is on this uh, on the slide here. Um, so it's a small dedicated bag for food. What we also found is exchanging and sharing um, as being an extensive practice in schools. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but uh, in all schools uh, where children stay after regular hours, um, there are snacks. Even in schools that do not allow uh, the exchanging or the sharing of snacks simply because of problems of theft. Well, even there, children um, do share their snacks. <clears throat> and you can truly observe migration of food items going from one child to another child, to another child, and yet another child. Um, it is very interesting to observe those migrations. Oftentimes, there are peer networks. So typically, those networks are within a given class. Less, there are less exchanges uh, between genders and there are less exchanges outside of the members of the classroom. And what we also see is older ones taking from younger ones. We're seeing the younger ones who are getting the food or food items for their older siblings. Um, but clearly, exchanging and sharing is a, a, an observation we have made consistently across all schools. Uh, the products that have the biggest value is potato chips, sweets, candy, cookies, um, sometimes, but less so, um, applesauce or fruit sauce, and last but not least, fruit. We don't see we don't see very many, and when we do, few uh, fruit items are effectively exchanged or shared. So, games and playing uh, have been observed consistency, no matter the income levels of the family, no matter the schools. But there have been some discrepancies. Uh, discrepancies 
in terms of income. Um, we've seen different behaviors around the table and the behavior in terms of language, clothing, body posture, uh, and again, I cannot go into the details, but some children behave better than others. Um, children coming from low-income families do not have the same uh, behaviors as children who come from um, upper-class families. Again, um, I'm, I'm saying this very, fa very fast, and of course it needs to be nuanced, but uh, there are some gaps, clearly, between <coughs> the profiles. What we have also found is the diversity in the profiles of uh, the staff working in cafeterias. I have identified different types of profiles. Um, we have vocational staff. Uh, and these are, this is temporary terminology that I will need to fine-tune uh, in, in the future. But vocational staff are people who work in, uh, with children uh, permanently. They have a, a full-time job at school and then something else on the side, working with children. Oftentimes, uh, those people are preparing specific uh, uh, are going to school to work with children. They uh, have a lot of ideas uh, to work, to be with the children, and different types of activities. Um, they're very proactive with children. They're very involved. Then we have transition staff. Transition staff, these are oftentimes young people, roughly uh, 20 years old on average, and two types of profiles. Either students who are trying to make some money uh, as um, on this side, or people who are in transition and who are working in school before moving on to something else. So oftentimes people who are um, looking for a, a, a better future, so to speak. And then the third profile, uh, these are um, experienced staff. These are exclusively women. On average, uh, they're on their 40s. Sometimes they are, we're talking about mothers. Uh, older people who have retired and who are, are uh, uh, they are actually there to supervise the children, to watch after the kids, but they, they are not expected to, to organize any activities with the children. They make sure the kids work well, I'm um, sorry, that the kids eat well and um, are, are, are stay safe and okay. So this is very important because the nature of the staff has an influence on the interaction with the kids. Kids don't interact the same way with a 20-year-old as with a 40-year-old. In conclusion, we have found a lot of consistency across the different schools we have observed, especially when it comes to playing and games. The staff plays a very important role. Um, the, the staff working in the cafeteria, the staff available for kids during recess, all play an important role in the socialization process of kids. A lot of consistency, but we also found gaps and discrepancies depending on the income levels. All this data still needs to be fine-tuned. Fine -tuned. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the members of the Bondewell Foundation for uh, this award. It has, uh, so they have supported me financially, which is important, which has been important for me over the past two years, but it has also given me scientific recognition, especially during conferences uh, where, that I have attended. So, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Indeed, Geraldine. Thank you. Thank you for all this information. Uh, and thanks for giving us an update on your research. You insisted uh, on the fact that you, consistent, that you uh, consistently observed 
at playing and, and, and games at school. Oftentimes parents tell their kids not to play. Well, I guess that some of the learning and learning better eating habits could also come from playing. So maybe telling kids not to play is not a good idea. Well, what, what, a lot of the, what you can hear the staff say is don't play with food. Don't do it. You're not allowed to play with food. There are even posters that say don't play with food, raise your finger, don't scream, and so on. But again, if, we're, if you're in school, in schools where kids ha are served, uh, um, you can't just expect them to not play for 45 minutes or one hour. They're young children. It's also a moment for eating is also a moment for them to to relax and and and, and this is really when they like to to share and, and communicate with others. You also said that um, the staff, the background of the staff is generally the same as the background of the children, um, income wise. Is that is this a factor that influences their? socializing of children? Well, as I said, uh, when, I, when I described the typology of, of staff, sometimes kids identify to one person, to one adult, because they like the way she dresses, for example, or f f for more behavioral uh, reasons. What we do see is that uh, with experienced uh, staff, the experienced staff and people or members are more likely to provide uh, food-related advice and have more of an educational approach. This is less true for young uh, staff members because oftentimes they, have, uh, they don't have right, the right eating habits themselves. <laughs> 